Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's live coverage here in San Francisco. I'm your host, John Furrier with Rob Strache. Savannah Peterson, the entire team coverage is here. Joel Minnick is on theCUBE. Back, CUBE alumni, Vice President, Marketing at Databricks. Joel, great to see you. Thanks you for too, John. having yeah. theCUBE and great to have you on. Thank you, glad to be back. So I know you've been running around. The show's been quite a big success. Tons of announcements. I mean, you couldn't even talk about all the announcements today. It was so technical. <laughs> the demos were phenomenal. Um, Databricks going kind of the next generation. You guys going through, that's the classic Databricks move. Keep innovating, go to mm -hmm. the next level. This week has been about open. For sure. Okay, yep. and we love some of, the, some of the stuff. Small language models, we've been talking about that on theCUBE for a year. Good to see that coming online. Uh, Unity open source. Mm -hmm. You guys are really putting down a, a good investment to make open work. It's been a big yes. part of the theme. Yeah. Um, Give us your take on the show so far and, and, and the core themes that you're, you're promoting. Yeah, absolutely. Open for sure. I mean, the, the central thesis of Databricks has always been you should be in control of your data. And as a result, in control of the workloads that then feed your data or that go off of your data. The one thing that we, or the two things we really wanted to solve this year, one is the lake house has always been about being able to bring all your data together your format that your data is stored in should not be something that drives then all the decisions you have to make beyond that. And so being able to bring Tabular and Databricks together and say, look, let's, let's jointly go and pursue the vision of the lake house by making Iceberg and Delta Lake fully interoperable was super important to our customers and super important to the two companies. And then being able to say on top of that, you know, that keystone of Databricks is how you govern your data with Unity Catalog. And that was something that, as we looked across all of the platform, was one piece of Databricks that wasn't yet open source. And we wanted to solve that problem for customers and give the, the market one standard for how you govern structured and unstructured data together. And being able to do that now by fully opening, open sourcing Unity Catalog and doing it today on stage yeah. um, was a big moment for Databricks and a big moment for our customers. The tabular thing was huge. and you know, There's a lot of money to put down. They only raised that much money, but great product, Iceberg. Was that about accelerating the, 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 the intersection of Iceberg and um, the data lake that you guys have? Or was it going to take too much time for Iceberg to come together? Was it you guys just trying to invest in accelerating Iceberg and format commonalities and unifying that? Is that was that the thinking behind it? Ex or more of get the team on, the on board? <laughs> it's about accelerating interoperability. Yeah. The, there are systems built on Delta Lake, there are systems built on Iceberg. That's fantastic. But as a user, I shouldn't have to worry about what format my data is in, and then how I can use my data. And so it was about bringing the two engineering teams together on Tabular and, and Databricks, be able to say, let's take that worry away from customers. Let's be able to have both teams working on uniform together to make it the best way to be able to use all data formats out there. And I, I think one of the big things that's also been going on this entire week has been the, the discussion about <clears throat> the acceleration from a BI perspective and from a SQL perspective mm -hmm. and how people are really, like you said, bringing it into the data lake or on top of the data lake and mm -hmm. using that same, they want to keep it in the same place. They don't right. want to have to move data. That, that's a, a no-no for the right. most part and costs a lot of money and this helps save that. What are you seeing? Because they were talking about you know, 7,000 customers really you know, embracing you know, Delta Lake mm -hmm. and moving into that and really accelerating their usage of it. I, to me, that, that's something that kind of was a little bit buried in the lead. I mean, it was a big, big one in the first keynote, but when you start to break that down and how many people are really going all in. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, I've gone this direction and I'm going all in on Databricks now because I can solve for these other mm -hmm. use cases. Yeah, that has been a big trend. Um, and I think it's a big part of what's driving Databricks' growth. And a lot of that has come through, Databricks SQL's a big part of it, for sure. Being able to have the most performant data warehouse out there now. But I would say on top of that, the biggest driver actually has been Unity Catalog. Um, and you know, when we get in conversations with customers about different ways they can go with their data platform, one of the things that often comes back to us is, you know, I can compare X and Y between two different vendors, but frankly, they don't have Unity Catalog. Um, and it's that ability to think about all my data assets and set governance on it once, 
and have that echo out through everything else I go and do with that data, that's a game changer for any CIO, any chief data officer who is trying to figure out how I get my arms around my data so I can use it. That, that is a superpower. Yeah. And and it, I, oh, sorry. <laughs> and it would seem yeah. like getting the metric layer into, into Unity Catalog was a big, a big piece that also could lead down the path towards the BI AI stuff that you mm -hmm. announced as well. Is that how, how, how it kind of played out for, you know, a big piece of this is, hey, we need to have fuller metadata, you know, all these relationships, mm -hmm. and then we can go delve down into that and start producing these reports and things of that nature on top. Well, AIBI without the, the metrics announcement that we made yeah. already works extraordinarily well. But having that metric store is something that as folks you know, kind of look and say, what's the, what's the one thing I wish it still did? It always came back to that. Yeah. Um, and so that was something we've definitely spent the last few months building to make sure that not only do we have great understanding of all of your data, but now also all those business metrics as well. Right, yeah. And that will make AIBI even more effective going forward. What's fundamental about the, the yeah. abstraction you guys are putting together with that catalog is you, um, from a data processing perspective, mm -hmm. okay, you got all, everything going on, but yeah. you're bringing two worlds together, data engineering and BI SQL writers. Yeah. I mean, you got two worlds. Mm -hmm. Those are two huge communities. Now they kind of come together as one because the data engineers will take in the Unity catalog mm -hmm. piece, whether it's open source or you guys, and then service all that data processing down the edge. Is, was that the thought behind it, or is that just kind of the It's absolutely result. the thought behind it. And, yeah. and what's the impact from yeah. a company standpoint? A full redo? Because I mean, we're hearing multiple things coming out of the show. <laughs> Tools from migration. Hey, mm -hmm. migrate all your old governance right. stuff with one, four clicks. Done. Mm -hmm. That's a data engineering kind of reset. And then we're hearing kind of incremental improvement. So, so there's different use cases. Is data engineering more important than say the analytics or both? How, how do you guys rec resolve that um, kind of persona difference or is it all the same? I don't think there's much mismatch in there. Yeah. I would look at it as, it doesn't matter what you want to go and do. If it's yeah. analytics or AI, the quality of your data is going to dictate the success of all of those things. So the strength of which the, the platform can handle data engineering is fundamental to just the success of the platform overall. And the announcements today around Lakeview were, how do we make that data engineering process on Databricks as fast and efficient as it possibly can be? And in particular, solve for one of the things that, that Databricks historically has not done as well, which is how do we make ingest really easy into the platform? And then having that available, as you said, into UC, where then the worlds start to come together between data scientists and analysts and data engineers, and then having that great foundation of the data that then the analysts and the engineers, or the ML engineers and the data scientists can all work on top of. Um, that's, that's the vision of Databricks, is you are a data team and you need to work together to do all of these different things, but do it on one common set of tools, one common foundation. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think when I looked at it and, you know, there's so many announcements and again, we, I got to give it, get a preview from yeah. you last week and everything, yeah. but when you start to look at it and mm -hmm. start to break it down, I mean, again, uh, when I, and I, I even asked you this question, but now, now that everything's out of the bag, I yeah. said, hey, why, why serverless, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it, it dawned on me yesterday, like the light bulb went off, and I, I think part of it was, hey, we can help even reduce the cost and do it better and help For operational sure. excellence. In fact, we were talking to a Coastal Community Bank yesterday uh, as part of one of our mm -hmm. one-on-ones and she was talking about the fact that I don't have a huge infrastructure team. We're all in the cloud and we're right. all going, I don't want to manage serverless right. and things like that. Has that helped you bring in a new class of customers who are, because we heard ease mm -hmm. of use yeah. in a couple t different places. Mm -hmm. It seems like that you're really honing in on that ease of use journey, mm -hmm. which also is bringing some of the tooling like dashboards and BI and Genie and some of the other stuff mm -hmm. in as well on the interface side, but it's from the ops all the way to the usage. Yeah. The ease of use. Yeah, it's a big part. It's, ease of use is one element of it for sure, where if you, if you don't have a, a data team who has got a lot of expertise in these different things. Serverless can be a massive accelerator. Yeah. Um, but even if you do have a data team who can do all those things, 
serverless can still be a massive accelerator because the efficiencies that come from a TCO perspective of I'm not paying for any idle time anymore. I don't have to worry about yeah. versioning of different Databricks runtimes or Spark runtimes anymore. I can do disaster recovery super easy because it just flips over. Um, those things all become big accelerators even for enterprises who've been on Databricks on the journey for, for the last 10 years. Um, but the, I think one of the kind of beauties of the philosophy Databricks has had is as we've embraced serverless now and the platform is completely serverless, we do not take any of the class experience away from you. So for customers who want to be able to customize all the different elements of a cluster and how they think about the platform, that's still there. And for the new crop of customers or new workloads that you want that service experience, that's now there too. So I noticed on the demo, yeah. on the Unity catalog, some nice cool features, the metrics, by mm -hmm. the way, I like that metrics piece. I think that's yeah. going to change the interface piece. Yeah. But this, it seems to me that the strategies, besides Ali laying out the vision of compute separate from data, and yeah, yeah. love the small language model, kind of teasing out the future, is that you got to nail the unified data storage and, mm -hmm. and, and data model, right? Number one, uniform yep. and Unity catalog. How does Mosaic play in? Because it feels like that's like, okay, get your picks and shovels out there, start building. Is that a tooling layer? Is that more of an app development layer? Mm -hmm. What's the relationships as Uniform comes out, Unity's going to roll, start rolling. What's the impact to Mosaic? And where do you see that going? What's the positioning? And how should yeah. people think about it? Yeah. So Databricks, when we think about the intersection of data and AI, and we say we're a data intelligence platform, what does that really mean? So, a lot of what we've talked about is on the data side of the equation, and increasingly as Databricks has sought to make data easier for customers to use, there's been a lot we've talked about bringing AI to your data, and how to make the platform easier to use because we're making AI-driven decisions around how to run the platform. The other side of the equation is to say then, well, if I have all this data, how do I go and use it to build my own intelligence, my own intelligent applications? And that's what Mosaic AI is. And it's that end-to-end -end workflow from the time that I get the data prepped, to how I build the model, to how I deploy the model, to how I then ultimately evaluate whether or not yeah. the model's successful. And the role of Unity Catalog is to underlie that and say, well, I'm going to set the governance on how the data I have can be used in these in training models, can be used in inference and what kind of responses I can give. And that becomes really powerful because I set it once down here and I don't have to worry about do I have leakage in other places going forward because all of that echoes up through the system. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we were, I was lucky enough to talk to Hanlon Tang just yeah. before coming over here. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that was really interesting from the Mosaic side of things, yeah. it's not just about Gen AI, it's actually these, uh, you know, complex systems and yes. actually the different mm -hmm. models talking to each other. Yeah. How has that message really resonated? Because I think to me that, that coming out of this space myself, I yeah. mean, again, I look at it and go, you have data features, data products, and data apps that are being built. Mm -hmm. AI's part of that, and Gen AI's part of that, right. and they actually have to work together. Mm -hmm. How do you see how prepared your customers are to go down that path yeah. at this point? It's new. It's absolutely new. I would say you know, the advent of compound AI systems, depending on who you ask, is between nine and six months old out there in the market. Yeah. But it's getting rapid adoption because what customers are able to see in terms of accuracy and latency improvements, when you start to approach it as, let me go and solve discrete problems in how I answer a question, rather than one dense model. Solving for inefficiencies in one dense model is very difficult. But if I can break the problem up and treat it more of, an, of a traditional engineering problem of, well, let's think about how we, form, how we interpret the question. Let's think about how we seek the facts. Let's think about how we formulate the response. And then I can zero in on where the inefficiency is at and solve that problem. Then I can move much, much quicker. And so we are finding for the customers who are starting to put things into production, particularly on newer use cases like putting AI agents out there into the world now or uh, multimodal mm -hmm. systems out there, the compound systems is moving much faster. Define the compound systems. That was a good yeah. concept. What does that mean? Yeah, it means that you bring different tools together. So if you think about the, the way we've talked about generative AI for the last couple years, we've talked about what's called a dense model, which means I have one single model tackling the entire problem 
from the time that I got the prompt from the user to the time I give you the answer back. Compound AI says, well, let's actually break it up into discrete units. So we may use one LLM that's just focused on interpreting the question asked because it's very good at that and it's honed to do that really well. Then a separate tool, that's probably a vector database to go and retrieve all the facts of what I know about the question you asked. And then maybe a different LLM coming to say, well, I'm really good at forming math problems. And this is a, I, this is a prompt about math. So I'm going to then take these facts and put a formula together. And then one final model at the end that says, okay, now I'll put all the pieces together and give you back the right response. It sounds more complicated, but it's actually in terms of solving a problem easier and you get a response yeah. exponentially faster. And the data sets are yeah. more accurate. More accurate. For their domain yeah. task. Yes. Specific yeah. task. So who, what, what links that together? What's the runtime? It sounds like it's an operating system to me. Yeah. I mean, you got a neural, little neural network right. in there, you got a little data prompt engineering. Yeah. What, what software runs that? I mean, is that run on what? Runs on Databricks. <laughs> <laughs> what a lead. <laughs> I mean, so, the, so, so I send it into Databricks, so I set it up all in, into the Databricks, into, yes. the, into the intelligence platform. Yeah, and that was and one of the things we announced today was a tool set to make all this work a lot better together called Agent Framework. Yeah. Okay. And Agent Framework brings together the SDK to put these pieces together. It brings together what's called Gen AI Tools, which is how I can do things like vector databases and calculators, mm -hmm. and these things need to be brought into the model. And it's how I can do the evaluation piece of it yeah. as well. And be able to understand, is this model doing what I expect it to do? And if it's not, help me diagnose why. So the inbound logistics on the prerequisite is the tooling, once you're in there, that's when that's kind of happening. Right. Inside the platform. Yes. Okay, good, yep. that's what I wanted to get yeah. at. Well, and that's the future, and that's why I thought, um, and again, we were talking about small language models for over a year. We call them special models with the power law. For sure, I heard I on, stage, about with you. With yeah. on stage today, yeah. I think that was really cool because I think that gives people confidence that that's relevant. Yes. Because the small language models, it's not about the size of the model, mm -hmm. it's where it fits into its specific execution. Right. right. Um, and so it, it's, it's going to be interesting to see that. So I'm really glad you guys did that because we're here, we're seeing the same thing. Totally. People yeah. want to protect their data and say, whoa, 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 help us. This is my data, right. but I'll use a different LLM mm -hmm. public. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's a data, that's a platform engineering problem, that's a data engineering problem, yeah, database I mean, I, problem. I think again that the whole fine tuning aspect of it and making that easy. And yeah. I, I, again, going through a lot of those and some of the announcements you had around putting the guardrails in and mm -hmm. things of that nature, I think is super important for getting from, from you know, evaluation, right. because we were talking about, only 15% 15 pe 15 have really gotten into right. production at mm -hmm. this point in time, and 85% are still evaluating, mm -hmm. and if they don't see ROI and get to production, some of that budget's going to dry up in the next year. So th I think that those types of things were really key. In fact, we're seeing that in the data yeah. from ETR. Uh, their July data is about to drop, and mm -hmm. when it does, you know, it's unbelievable about the use cases, and there's a spike in people saying that they haven't gotten production because of the actual budget has dried up on it. Oh, interesting. Yeah, 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 it's, yeah. it's very, very interesting. What are you seeing about people talking about how they've been successful on top of Databricks, and mm -hmm. how, are there certain use cases you've seen from an, a Gen AI perspective that have been more successful than others? Well, I mean, I think at the stage we're at with Jet AI, everybody is seeing success with chatbots, yeah. right? So what's next after chatbots? And some of the places where I think this is really coming to light is there's really interesting work now being done in image analysis, um, where Gen AI and multimodal systems have been really effective. One of the other places that I'm starting to see things start to take off as well um, is in both the healthcare and the legal professions, where folks are starting to build agents to really begin to understand what's going on inside the data that I've got. So, can I understand where have I signed into non-traditional clauses in contracts, and I need to understand what my exposure is. If I'm going to go and change something, what have I committed to in the past? And, and not just since the last couple years, but in perpetuity, what have I committed to? Or in healthcare records, go and look at this patient's history across many different systems and begin to come back and tell me, stitch this data together. Find me the more interesting sort of needle in the haystack 
things that may be going on with this patient that I'm not seeing because I'm looking in just one system at a time. Um, those have been places where I think we'll start to see generative AI moving from being a place where I can answer questions for you um, to being in a place where I can really help you do your job much, much more effectively. Um, but what I don't think will necessarily go away, and Jensen alluded to this yesterday, where chatbots will be super important and it's a massive opportunity is just in customer service. Customer service is a place that I think we'll see generative AI have massive disruption because it will be so helpful in companies delivering better service to customers. Yeah. Joel, I want to get your thoughts on uh, what's next after the show. Obviously the acquisition of Tabular is huge. Mm -hmm. Open source is obviously in your DNA. We've been covering it since the founding of the company. Um, but Databricks has pretty much been the driver of most of it's all the open source action. Mm -hmm. And it looks like it's clear that you guys are now continuing to bring that sure. out, and so you have more moment momentum outside of Databricks. So outside yeah. of Databricks' core contribution, a lot more, we see more uptake. Mm -hmm. Still a lot smaller percentage relative to the overall Databricks influence, and certainly Iceberg coming in, that's going to change things. How do you guys market to that audience? Because we've been following Kubernetes for 10 years, that, that those communities are highly you know, in demand, they want more AI. So yeah. we're seeing growth there. Mm -hmm. How are you going to market to that AI um, community and open source? And what, what's your plans for Databricks to tell this story? Because it's a next level Databricks story. Mm -hmm. It's a lot bigger. Yeah. Um, the compute separates, it's going to certainly change the, the enterprise mm -hmm. compute equation mm -hmm. with separating the data from the compute. Yeah. What's your strategy as head of marketing, looking at, <laughs> looking at how the market, you got to yeah. knock down some things. What's the objectives? What are you trying to do? Yeah. Well, I mean, we make very big investments in the communities that are out yeah. there. We're going to continue to do that. I think one of the strengths of Databricks throughout the years is maintaining its, its connection to the community. In fact, even this conference we're at, this is not a, a Databricks vendor conference. 90, about 90% 90 of the content that gets delivered at this conference is community-led conference. Yeah. Uh, or community-led content. Yeah. And that's kind of how we've always thought about it, is this should be a meeting of the minds of how people are just out there pursuing data and AI problems, traditionally through an open source way. That's not going to go anywhere. And so, working through the communities and keeping that community connection, hearing what the communities are interested in, is part of our DNA. Yeah. I think one of the things then kind of going forward, and what, is, what do some of the announcements mean for Databricks going forward? We talked about UC, we talked about the, the tabular acquisition and what's going on with Mosaic. I think one of the other really interesting ones then is what goes and happens with the people who don't use Databricks today. That Databricks, you know, as we've talked about, it's out there solving data and problems. It's been focused on folks who know how to use data. The announcement we made around AIBI today was about how do you put the same power of Databricks in the hands of everybody else? the finance department, the marketing department, the HR department, who want to leverage that data that's in their, in their data platform, in their lake house with Databricks, but they don't know SQL, they don't know Python. And now being able to pull up a dashboard, see something has changed, and then go have a natural language conversation with the data in their jargon against their data and get real meaningful answers back that are certified and reliable, I think it's going to be a real game changer for how we think about the democratization of data and AI going forward in a very big way. And if you had to stack rank the priorities for you in terms of educating the market, because it's a new category, I mean, I mean yeah. it's kind of the same category, but Gen AI has certainly changed what Dataverse is doing, mm -hmm. obviously acquisitions. Yeah. Uh, what's, the, what's the educational strategy? Obviously a very learning conference here, as you said. Yeah. What's the focus, what's the ranking in terms of educating the public on um, what this is all about? On what Dataverse is all about? Yeah, yeah. What's, yeah. Give, me, give me the top three, or top, stack rank them. Yeah, I mean, the, the most important thing at the end of the day is how you, how you think about your data. So, Unity Catalog, huge priority for Databricks. Second be, behind that then is, what are the two number one things customers are trying to do with their data today? So, we are first leading with marketing around UC and the importance of understanding your data. Then second, Gen AI. It is on the tip of everybody's tongue and how I do more with that. And then third is data warehousing. Um, and Databricks SQL and how folks run analytics much, much more effectively. Um, it's going to continue to be a huge driver of Databricks' marketing strategy going Good. forward. Good. And you're happy with the results of uh, the show? I mean, you got to be pretty Oh, pumped. it's been massive. I mean, it's been massive. <laughs> we heard from yeah. the yeah. analyst session, it was pretty hot. Yeah. Oh, it was I mean, awesome. it's pretty hot here, yeah. pretty rocking. Yes, yeah, 16,000 in person, yeah. probably around 45, 50,000 total when taken to the virtual uh, audience, and yeah. it's been a huge growth here for us. 
Joel, congratulations. Uh, say congrats to Ollie from us and the team. Will do. Yeah. We didn't get him on this year. Last year he had a great session on theCUBE. Um, just great to see the, the product success. And then pushing the envelope, really kind of playing long game, you know, focusing on the standards, really giving up a lot there. Just, you could just, you try to force, you know, leave a lot on the table to get the, play the long game for customers and make this open formats work. I think, I think that's going to be a big, good open bet. Open is fundamental. Yeah, it's, it's a good yeah. bet. Thanks for yeah. coming on theCUBE. Thank you. All right, I'm John Furrier, theCUBE with Rob Stretchy. We'll be back with more to close down theCUBE here in day two, day three of the summit. I'm John Furrier, theCUBE for Rob Stretchy and Savannah Peterson. We'll be right back.